Next, our next speaker is it you. <laughs> I, I think our next speaker doesn't need any introduction. It is uh, Robert N. Smith. He's going to talk to us on proximal femoral periprosthetic fractures. Robert. Okay. Th thanks very much. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about the commonest fracture that you're going to be seeing with regards to uh, periprosthetic fractures, and that's the proximal femoral type of fracture. Uh, approximately 4% of revisions, 1% of primaries, and your commonest patient that you're going to see it in is the lady of 70 years plus. Now you can see in the registries how total knees are becoming very, very much more common, now overtaking the hips, but the total hip fracture rates still remain much higher than, than the total knee fracture rates. Um, as a cause of revision surgery, what's very interesting to see is that in the bipolar hips, periprosthetic fractures are the commonest cause for a revision of a bipolar second most common in the unipolar, um, and it comes down to about fourth in the primary hips. And this is probably just a reflection on the age of the, and the fragility of the patient, uh, the patient age group as to when they're fracturing. So the types, uh, one can get stress fractures as a cause of pain around a, a total hip, not nearly as common as the tibial side. Uh, you can, intraoperatively, you get calcar splits, when you're using particularly the uh, wedge-shaped and uh, non-cemented type of implants, and you have to be really careful and, and have a good look for splits intraoperatively. If you find them, you must pull back the stem, cable it, and then reinsert the implant if it's not a major split. Um, then you get the post-operative type of prosthetic fracture. The early ones are, are usually traumatic and usually have been associated with an unrecognized split that has occurred uh, intraoperatively. And then the late type of fractures you get are the osteolytic ones usually. As I mentioned before, usually the periprosthetic fractures that are stress related are around the tibial stem, but you do see them occasionally at the tip of a, a non-cemented femoral implant. And, and those you can actually treat conservatively just with, with um, partial weight bearing. The early post-op fractures, these are the ones that you usually see here where there's been an aggressive Approaching and, and impaction of, of the non-cemented type of implants. Um, and there usually can, is a unrecognized small crack fracture and they start weight bearing on them and then within the first six months they, proceed, they progress to full fracture. Um, and the implants that are most likely to blame are these type of triple tapered wedge fit uh, designs. Uh, and these usually fracture high up in the metaphysis and the, the fully coated uh, cylindrical type of implants tend to fracture down here, and that's usually due to aggressive over-reaming. Risk factors, obviously poor bone stock is one of the commonest things that we see it in, um, in the poor uh, steroid usages, stress rises, and particularly this, if you're removing plates and screws, you really should try and, and bypass them or at least protect weight bearing them for the first couple of months if you're removing uh, uh, rigid screw plates, etc., and, and you uh, are putting an implant past it. The multiple previous surgeries uh, in the revisions, obviously the more difficult the exposure, and you're gonna be pushing and pulling those limbs, you're gonna uh, predispose to cracking the femur when you may not recognize it until you start mobilizing them and then they progress to, to full fracture. The primary protrusios, it's very wise to cut the neck in situ before you try and start uh, the operation. Otherwise, it's very easy to, to crack the femur and you don't recognize it until after you've um, done the operation and then you suddenly the, it progresses to a full split. The MIS, sorry, the MIS procedures carry about a 3% risk of, of fracturing. So the, the uh, commonest uh, in the first year are these uncemented press fit implants, as I've mentioned before. One of the important things to remember is, is when you're inserting them, if you suddenly feel that they, they, the, the resistance changes as you're impacting it, then you know that you've got a problem. You must go and look for those, those calcar splits or other splits, because those are the ones that you're going to run into post-operative problems with them. Um, the longer stem implants, they tend to have problems if you have a, a, a femoral bone mismatch in the femur. Um, and revisions, the cement removal is probably the biggest 
uh, cause of, of uh, intraoperative fractures that you're going to see, uh, where you're going to create windows down the femur, and those then are stress rises and, and can proceed to, to fracturing. Now, Clive Duncan, many years ago, he this is the most common classification that you can see. That's the Vancouver classification. It's, it's a very good one as well. Uh, I'm sure you all know it. It's, it's the, the type A, which is uh, either the greater trochanter or the lesser trochanter. Type B is the bed of the implant where it's well fixed, not fixed type B2, and then not fixed with poor bone stock. That's at B1, 2, 3. So those are all around the implant with only B1 being well fixed. The other two not fixed, and it just depends on the quality of the bone for the subclassification. And then type C is where it's, it's uh, actually below the implant. And this is a very practical classification. Um, and then a couple of years back, Faris Haddad joined up with Clive, and they proposed this classification, which they call the Unified Classification System. Basically, it's using the Vancouver of ABC here, and then they've just added D, E, F here. And we'll quickly run through that for you. So the A, as mentioned before, is the, either the greater or the lesser trochanter. And what they say, what's important here, is, is the soft tissue that's attached to that important? So if it's a lesser trochanter, probably not. Is it displaced? Very important in the greater trochanter. And the cause, that's vital. So if you've got an osteolytic type of trochanteric fracture, then you're not going to just go and fix that. You're obviously going to go to complete revision uh, because the cup is, uh, the poly is worn on that side. So, so it's important to know what the cause of this fracture is. The type 2, uh, as you mentioned before, well fixed and, and loose. The cemented type of, of B1s generally tend to not be fixed. So they're actually usually a B2. The cementless are the difficult ones to, to uh, assess. The more porous coated they are, the more likely they are to be ingrown. The, hydro the HA coated ones and the finer coatings tend not to be fixed. So if you see these metaphyseal, mainly porous coated implants, those generally are well fixed. And they put a figure of about 50%, more than 50% ingrowth. I'm not quite sure how you work that out, but um, <clears throat> they give that figure of 50% if it's usually well fixed. More fragments, obviously there's less surface area, more likely to be uh, not fixed and require a revision. And the more distal, obviously it's going to be better fixed, particularly with the metaphyseal um, coated type of implants. But in any B1, if you're going to be doing an RF for it, you must have your revision set available, because you can get caught short. And you must have adequate exposure. And, uh, doing percutaneous fixation on these B1s it's not a great idea. You must go and actually have a look at how well fixed that implant is before you decide not, uh, to do an RF or a revision on these. This is the type C where you fractured well clear of the implant and it's treated just as a, a standard fracture. Um, with the resurfacing, it's been quite interesting. This is a type C on a resurfacing and that can easily be treated purely with uh, RF. The type D is dividing one bone and two, two replacements. So you've got a hip and a knee, and you fracture it in between. Here you use what they call the block art analysis, and you classify each one according to what it actually is. So there's a B1 and there's a C, and then you treat it accordingly. The E is where you've got two bones and one joint. So you fracture it either side of the implant, such as an acetabular fracture and a periprosthetic femoral fracture, or a femur and a tibia. Once again, you treat each according to its merits. And the F is where you have, say, an acetabular fracture in a, in a bipolar or a monopolar, and you treat it as, a, as you would a, a standard fracture. And obviously depends on the degree of displacement, particularly with the patellar fractures. Okay, so to take a message, basically, the status of the implant, fixed or not fixed, as to what you're going to be doing with these periprosthetic fractures. If it's stable, it's well aligned, good quality bone, these patients are, can, are quite adequate uh, just to do internal fixation. If it's loose, malaligned, or it's deformed, needs revision. So here you see a type C on a resurfacing here, but you look at the cup, 
the cup's in a really lousy position. So you wouldn't go and just do an internal fixation on that, you'd go and do a full revision on it. The obvious problems with the, the PPFs is that the implants are in the canal and they will frequently get in your way and uh, limit what uh, fixation you're going to be doing around the actual implant. The other very important thing is this. There's been a lot of endosteal ischemia, especially with the cemented type of implants. So you're getting really poor blood supply inside and outside the bone. And very frequent non-union breakage of implants uh, due to this. And I'll show you a, a case similar to this. This type of fracture here, it's basically a type C. It's a very dangerous type of fracture. It looks quite easy, stick a plate on, and you'll get away with it. Problem is here, it's just, there's all the cement, it's down there, thinnish bone, and these are the ones that you really got to watch out for. Here you see another patient here, really nice long spiral fracture, it looks good, it's at the tip there, nicely, nicely plated, fracture's well reduced, everything looks hunky-dory, and this is what happens. That's that whole bit of bone there is ischemic. So, and there's no support medially there, and the plate will then break. So our fixation options, uh, we can do pure strut grafting, and we'll come up to that now. You can use screws, cables, and the type Cs, you can use intramedullary devices if you wish. Um, and then the other options are the salvage options of revision arthroplasty or proximal femoral replacements. Strut grafting, we rarely use it alone nowadays, and usually used along with the revisions or in conjunction with the platings. Now we've got a whole manner of plates from all the different companies, with the trochanteric fixation clamps, and, and most of them are now locking plates, which are, are very good for these type of fractures. And Synthes has got a very nice little fracture plate here, which you can use around the implant, which you can bypass quite nicely and you can put it at any level, and you just screw it in, into and over the uh, underlying plate. Typically, we'll, we'll put screws in distally, and we'll put circlage wires around the implant, but these must be supplemented. You must try and get at least a couple of um, unicortical screws in around here as well, because purely cabling around the implant doesn't do well. So you really should consider getting a few unicorticals up here as well. And in the patients that we've mentioned already, you should consider using strut grafts in addition to that. If the bone's very poor, you can use some of these uh, additional um, screw augmentation type of cements that, that can help with the fixation of those screws. And just lastly, we'll just briefly touch on the revision. Um, basically, the revisions are for all those patients where you've got loose implants and avoids the potentials of the malunion, non-unions, etc. And it's important to bypass the fracture by, I use about six centimeters um, or two cortical diameters as a minimum of bypassing with your, your long stem revision prosthesis. Um, and most of the time I'll use a non-cemented type of implant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Before I open the floor for questions, the question I have is, Robert, if you see a greater trochanteric fracture after a total hip replacement, is it always necessary to fix it? And on what do you rely? Do you rely on your x-rays, the displacement of the fracture, or do you rely on a trend about clinical signs? Yeah, I think certainly if they've got any, any degree of displacement, more than a two or three millimeters, I think you need to go and fix it, because that's going to displace. Um, you're talking about immediate post-op, yeah. immediate post-op. Uh, yeah, uh, and if you are treating conservatively, obviously non-weight bearing, I think by about six weeks, if you find that they're still getting a trend Ellenberg gait uh, and there hasn't been a displacement, then it means that you've got abductor weakness and you should probably go in at that stage and, and fix it. Following on that, Robert, if you see a patient, you've done a hip replacement, looking fine, post-op x-ray is fine, you see them six weeks down the line, they still want two crutches, you take an x-ray and, and you've got a tip of the trochanter displaced. Um, how do you treat that? You mean just a Six minor, yeah. a minor little, yeah. uh, what sort of approach is it? Was it a lateral approach? Lateral approach. Because that's usually when you get it is a lateral approach when you drill the holes for the greater trochanter. Uh, six weeks maybe is a little bit early to go back in. Probably give them a little bit longer than that. 
because that may well be an abducted detachment. We'll probably give it to about three months before we go back in. Mm. Because I didn't have a lot of joy with those hook plates. When you put that on, mm. the Trugant often escapes underneath that plate and it's difficult to put it back on. Any questions? One question from the floor for Rob. Oh, thank you, Rob. Thank you. Thank you.